Well, welcome back, hockey fans, as we continue to look at the illustrious career of Paul Coffey, one of the all-time great defensemen, one of the all-time great hockey players, period. Last week, we went over part one of his career, those amazing days with the Edmonton Oilers, where he set records, compelled many awards, won Stanley Cups, and fought an on-ice bond with arguably the greatest player of all time in Wayne Gretzky. If you did not see part one, I suggest you check it out first, today, we will be looking at his days as a member of the Pittsburgh Penguins. He played alongside the great Gretzky, and now he gets to play alongside the magnificent Mario. When we last left you, Coffey had won a Stanley Cup with the Oilers, his third as a matter of fact, in a season marred with injuries. However, at this point, he was seventh all-time among defensemen in scoring at just 26 years old. By late August 1987, however, Coffey was prepared to play in the Canada Cup, his second tournament. Remember, he was an all-star in 1984. However, also in the summer of that year, rumors started about his status with the Oilers squad, and he wasn't the only one. Mark Messier and Glenn Anderson also had issues over their contracts. Now, these weren't issues of ego like you see almost on a daily basis in professional sports today. It was more so about getting what they felt was owed. And yes, I know what you're saying, but damn, that's what people do these days. No, not really. I mean, come on. Here's something a little interesting that you all might love to see. Now, salary figures from the 1980s are hard to research. As a matter of fact, however, I only found this article from defunct Sport Magazine, but this list for annual hockey player salaries that came out in the summer of 1987. Now, granted, there weren't many surprises here as you see this list, but Dave Taylor was that high in 1987? I mean, as great as he was, come on. Ber Barry Peterson, really? Oh, well, okay, to be fair, this probably stems from his days in Boston where, for a brief time, he was a very good forward. But the fact is, Paul Coffey is not on this list. As a matter of fact, the only oiler here is Wayne Gretzky. And look at this, there are three New York Islanders, the other team that has been dominant in this decade, who won four Stanley Cups in a row, has three future Hall of Famers on this list. Makes perfect sense. But no other Edmonton Oilers, again. There have been only two dominant teams in this decade, the Oilers and the Islanders. And yes, the Habs had won one Stanley Cup, but that was it. I mean, come on. Damn Barry Peterson, the Canucks will pay him that much, yet they won't pay Anderson, Messier, or Coffey? All three of them deserved what they asked for at this point, in my opinion. Now, according to the report by the Washington Post in November of 1987, Coffey's contract was worth $325,000 a year, with two years remaining. Some could argue that the Oilers were spending all their money on Wayne. Okay, you might say that. This And hey, don't get me wrong, Wayne had earned every single penny. This team had been selling out games consistently since they entered the league in 1979. Their merchandise was moving like mad. This was around the time where buying jerseys was becoming very popular. And you best believe Paul Coffey was always among the top sellers. I mean, come on, he was one of the most popular players in the league. He had a lot of all-star votes every single year, and that wasn't just confined to the cities he played for. A trend that would continue pretty much towards the end of his career, but we'll obviously get to all that. But Paul Coffey is just another greedy bastard, right? Or could it be that Glenn Sather is stubborn and that owner Peter Pocklington is simply a cheap son of a bitch? Well, be that as it may, Paul Coffey played in the Canada Cup tournament that year. That, of course, was the infamous tournament of Gretzky and Lemieux. This team, however, as a whole, had, get this, 12 future Hall of Famers, and even a few you can make a case for. Hmm, actually gives me future video ideas. <laughs> anyway, the owners were again well re represented here, but this time there was only five compared to eight in 1984. Glenn Sather was not coaching the team, however. Mike Keenan was. However, much respected Oilers assistant John Muckler assisted Keenan through this tournament. The Oilers still had more representatives than anyone else on Team Canada, one more than Keenan's own Philadelphia Flyers team. And the Oilers had three other players representing their home nations, respectively. Kent Nilsson, of course, playing for Sweden. And on Finland, Yari Curry and Rejo Ruotsalania. And I know I'm pronouncing that wrong, forgive me. Uh, representing Finland. Many have regarded this as the finest tournament ever played. And the final spitting Canada against the Soviets was the best series of games ever played. Lemieux scored an infamous goal in Game 2 in double overtime to tie the series. The most famous goal since Paul Henderson's 1972 winner. That was, of course, until Game 3. Yes, indeed, Canada were champions again. Paul Coffey now had his second Canada Cup, 
And he had two goals and four assists for six points. It was a plus one. Not bad at all. But Ray Bork and Larry Murphy were clearly the elite blue liners of this tournament. So now that the Canada Cup was all said and done for 1987, training camp was the big question. Coffee wasn't the only one holding out, as I said. Mark Messi and Glenn Anderson were also not interested in playing anywhere else other than Edmonton. Why would they want to leave a team winning championships? None of them wanted to leave. That's just it. The owners were looking bleak going into the new season. Indeed, Kent Nielsen and Rejo Rusilanian, both key in the Oilers' 87 Stanley Cup win, were both off to Europe. Also, the fact that Anderson, Messier, and Coffey could not be with the team throughout the year was also a heavy prospect that weighed on the minds of many Oilers fans and made headlines across Canada in the sports section. However, Anderson eventually reported for whatever reason, nobody really knows. Yet Messier and Coffey were still holdouts. So the regular season was about to start, and neither man had been involved in training camp or preseason in any way. However, the very day the regular season started, Messier got the deal he wanted and was back in uniform, just in time to see the new Stanley Cup banner raised. But Coffey still wasn't. The season was underway, and by late November, Coffey and Sather's impasse had no end in sight, according to Mark Messier's autobiography. It was now beyond a hockey issue and more a personality issue between the two parties involved. The Oilers were playing okay, but not great. His absence was felt, something Messier himself has said. So on November 24, 1987, a blockbuster trade was made. Paul Coffey, along with longtime fan favorite Dave Hunter and prospect Wayne Van Dorp, I must say, pretty cool name, go to the Pittsburgh Penguins. The Oilers received veteran defenseman Mo Mantha Jr., grinding forward Dave Hannon, and two very recent first-round draft picks, defenseman Chris Joseph and forward Craig Simpson. So officially, Paul Coffey was a Pittsburgh Penguin, and at last, someone other than Mario Lemieux was grabbing headlines on the hockey page in that town. In a strange irony to this situation, Paul Coffey had missed 21 games already this season due to this issue, the same amount he missed due to injuries the year prior. But this was huge for the Penguins. Mario Lemieux was indeed proving himself, as his nickname describes him, magnificent. He had three seasons all under his belt already, all of which were 100 points plus, including 141 in 85-86 and second in scoring to, well, you know who. The Pens, however, as a team, were not improving. Sadly, there have been bad management issues over the last several years, terrible coaching, and they've all sunk the franchise and made them a perennial joke. The Mew gave the city and the team hope, and while slight improvements were made, as the Pens were simply bad, but not awful, the team still bolstered losing records each passing year and missed the playoffs, which they hadn't made since 1982. Coffey was stepping into a new territory. He didn't have the same type of talent around him. He was going from the best team in the league to one of the annually worst. But he was up for the challenge, and Coffey was set to make his debut as a Penguin the very next day after the trade, on November 25, 1987, in a home game against the Quebec Nordiques. The Pens were 7-10-4, so again below average. As for Mario, he was part of a heated scoring race that was utterly insane even this early in the season. Even Gretzky wasn't quite running away with it yet. Lemieux had led the league in goals at this point with 18, and was averaging just over two points a game. He was on his way to a huge season regardless. Coffey's debut was met with a lot of fanfare, as he seemed genuinely happy to be in Pittsburgh, and the fans seemed very happy to see him. But would Lemieux garner the support he had sought out? He had talented forwards on his team in the past, such as Dan Quinn and Randy Cunningworth at this point, and also had Mike Bullard in previous years. But they weren't a uh, Curry, Anderson, or a Messier, or even a Coffey behind him like Gretzky had around him. But in Coffey's debut, he had three assists on the evening, and two of them collaborated with Lemieux. Lemieux had four points on the night as they beat the Nordiques 6-4. In Coffey's first ten games as a Penguin, this again is completely separate from everything else I'm going to go over, he had a goal and 15 assists for 16 points as he and Lemieux clicked instantly. After his first seven games, however, Coffey would miss three total. But in the first seven games together, we'll go over those specifically, Lemieux had seven goals and 11 assists for 18 points, averaging 2.57 points a game, and the Penguins went 5 one and one in that stretch. Now, out of those seven games in the scoring race, Lemieux was now second, only 16 points behind Gretzky, who himself was going on a tear at that point. And Gretzky also tied Lemieux with the league leading goals in 25. But you notice Lemieux's assist game is actually changing. Hmm, I wonder why. After missing those three games, Coffey returns for another three, but is injured again and misses 10 games. Seems like deja vu all over again for our hero. Lemieux stays hot in that stretch of those 10 games Coffey missed, with 12 goals, 9 assists for 21 points again, just averaging two, over 2 points a game. That averages down from his time with Coffey, but regardless, 
he again is doing well in the scoring race, despite the Pens going 1-5-4 and four without coffee. How's Lemieux doing in the scoring race? He took the lead over Gretzky by three points? Unheard of! Uncanny! Inconceivable! Well, well, okay, I should mention that Gretzky got injured on uh, New Year's, around New Year's Day, but it ended up missing as many, many games. As a matter of fact, he'd miss about 16 that whole year. But anyway, anyway, that's neither here nor there. But regardless, it seems like Lemieux and Coffee were becoming a true tandem, and this, of course, would play out the rest of the year once Coffee returned. Now, again, as I said, it seemed like deja vu for our hero, but that would not be the case the rest of the year. He would stay healthy, playing the remaining 36 games without incident. And he and Lemieux both made it to the NHL All-Star game that year together. And Lemieux won the game MVP with six points, his second All-Star game MVP. And Lemieux, in those remaining 36 games, scored 28 goals, 51 assists for 79 points, just over 2.19 points a game. And the Penguins would go 20 and 16 in those games. Also, in the, as we total the whole year, Lemieux played 31 games without Paul Coffey. Now, this again, Lemieux missed three the whole year, I should reiterate. He played 31 games without Coffey in the games he'd actually played. Lemieux had 32 goals and 31 assists for 63 points in that game. 2.03 points a game, still incredible. More goals than assists. However, in the 46 games they played together, Lemieux had 38 goals and 67 assists for 105 points. So, yes, that is the answer to your question, but, oh, gee, Bill, isn't this supposed to be about Paul Coffey? Uh, no, it's also supposed to be how this video series is, with the franchise players of this series, and other good players as well on those teams. He had immediate impact on Lemieux, and it showed, and the Penguins team as a whole was improving because of it. Coffey had 15 goals and 52 assists that year for 67 points, the same total he had the year before, but did it in 13 less games. Remarkable. He did finish in the minus, however, for the first time in his career, but it was just a minus one. Nothing really to get overly concerned about. As for Norris Trophy voting, despite only playing 46 games, he still got some votes and came in seventh. Not too shabby. He once again finished fifth amongst defenseman scorers with his 67 points, just one ahead of the man he tied for fifth last year in Phil Housley. Now, let's dive deep into those very same numbers that we did with Gretzky in the previous videos. How did he fare with Lemieux? Well, out of Lemieux's 70 goals, Coffey assisted on 13 of them. Good enough for second best on the team. And just over 18.5%. Made all the more impressive that, again, he only lost out by Randy, one assist to Randy Cunningworth, who played the entire season with Lemieux. For Coffey's 15 goals, Lemieux assisted on 7 of them. That's just slightly under half. But now we go to my favorite stat, assist collaborations. Lemieux had 98 on the year, a career high. And to the surprise of literally no one, Paul Coffey leads the way with 19 collaborations. That's nearly 19.5%. It's no wonder, since Lemieux's assist game had improved drastically since Coffey had joined the club. It was already very good, but still was a whole new level now. Coffey was far ahead of anyone else in this category to boot. And let's face it, even though Gretzky missed 16 games, and yes, we'll admit, it could have been a much different scoring race, and Gretzky could have probably won it. But it was Coffey's impact on Lemieux as a whole that helped him win that scoring title for the first time, breaking Gretzky's streak of seven straight. And also, Lemieux broke Gretzky, another streak from Gretzky, eight straight Hart Trophy wins as MVP. Lemieux took it home this year. This was a career year for Super Mario, and it does not happen without Paul Coffey. Speaking of without Coffey, how did Gretzky do this season? Well, we have to keep in mind he did miss those 16 games due to injury and played 64, but still finished with a highly impressive 149 points. Let's look at Gretzky's chart of how he has done without coffee. Now, we look at here at points per game. Again, Gretzky had 2.3 points a game like he did last season when coffee was hurt for 21 games. Now, his first NHL year, he didn't have Curry and Anderson either, aside from Coffee, and Messier did not see as much ice time, so that's neither here nor there. But the three lowest totals before that are 1980-81, Coffee's rookie year, 1986-87, again, where he was injured a lot of the time, and this past year, his first without Coffee. Indeed, we can analyze these stats any which way. Gretzky will still be Gretzky and rack up psychotic numbers, but Coffee left behind an impact, to be honest. But was it Gretzky who really missed Coffee the most? Here's a surprising what a twist! Yari Curry had a good year. Yes, he did once again, as always. But he was missing both Coffee all year and Gretzky in those 16 games. 96 points, still an amazing season. And his, but his streak of 5 straight 100 point seasons had come to an end. 
It was definitely a combination of all those things that made that happen. As a matter of fact, Curry would manage to squeak out one more 100-point season without Gretzky the very following year, but never reach that total again as he would play another decade in the league. However, it was interesting that the Edmonton Oilers finished with 99 points. It was the first year since Coffey's rookie year they didn't finish with at least 100. They also had lost first place to despite the Calgary. But as for Pittsburgh, they were in the tightest division in the league, the Patrick Division. Going into the final weekend of the season, it was crazy. On the morning of April 2nd, 1988, the top three teams in the Patrick Division had their ticket punched. But that final spot was still up for grabs. It looks like the Rangers may have had it in hand, and the Devils had a good chance. The Penguins may need a miracle. But on this night, the Penguins find themselves facing their division rivals, the Washington Capitals, on the road. Oh boy, oh boy. The Caps strike first with Mike Gunner slowing early in the first with his last ditch attempt to try to reach 50 goals in the season. This is his 47. But then, boom! Super Mario Mushroom Power! One, two, three goals! Two shorthanded and a power play? Is there anything this kid can't do? 3-1 pens after one. Zarly Zalapski makes it 4-1, but Michel Pavanka scores two quick goals and the lead is cut to one. But our hero comes through. Coffee scores to give the Penguins a two-goal lead, but sadly, 37 seconds later, Mike Gardner scores again, and Dale Hunter ends up tying it. It's 5-5 after two. Coffee scores again in the third period to restore the Penguins' lead. But again, the clutch to himself, Dale Hunter scores again to tie it. It's 6-6, headed to overtime. The Pens need a win. A tie will eliminate them. The time is winding down, but then Super Mario in the clutch. 58 seconds left, the Penguins are still alive. But unfortunately, thanks to a big night from Kirk Muller, so are the New Jersey Devils, who won 5-2 and now move slightly ahead of the Rangers. But fear not, miracles can still happen. So now it comes down to this final day of the season. Our heroes need both the Devils and the Rangers to lose. Each team is feeling the heat. The Devils haven't made it since arriving in New Jersey in 1982. While the Rangers haven't missed in over a decade as well. They don't want to end that streak. And ironically, 1982 is the last year the Penguins made it. The Rangers and Quebec squared off that afternoon. And the Pens hopes were shattered. The Rangers won. The upcoming game against the Whalers later that day meant nothing. However, the Penguins didn't see it that way. They still won the game 4-2 and finished with their best regular season record since 1978-79, their first above 500 season since then. As for Coffee, however, it would be his first year without a playoff. As for the Oilers, well, yeah, they got the last laugh again this year, but oh, pockets Pocklington later that summer would definitely make another big decision regarding money. Hmm. Despite this, however, this year was a complete failure as the Pens are now looking like a team who can put something together and Coffee is a big part of what has been missing in the big puzzle. He has some young talent they needed to develop, but still, this team could finally make the playoffs in the very near future. Coffee started the year with his second Canada Cup and a contract dispute, but he both joined the Penguins had 15 goals, 52 assists for 67 points in just 46 games. He played in the NHL All-Star game for a sixth time, was fifth among defensemen scorers, helped the Penguins with their first winning record in nearly a decade, and above all, had an immediate and positive impact on superstar Mario Lemieux. The Penguins had a goal going into the 1988-89 season. That was simply to become a playoff team. In his first year with the Penguins, Paul Coffey proved he was still a difference maker, and Mario Lemieux benefited as the rest of the team. But after playing just 105 games in two seasons, Coffey was determined to stay healthy and benefit this team and make them into a contender. The one beauty of players departing successful teams for another team is that it tests their abilities, and Coffey so far was passing that with flying colors. And indeed, it all paid off. The Penguins had their first 40 wins season ever, and Coffey was a significant part of that. He was showing us once again why he is so amazing at what he does. He'd only missed five games that whole year, and amassed 30 goals, 83 assists for 113 points. His first 100-point season since his record-setting year of 85-86, and his third 100-point season overall. 
Also, Dan Quinn, as well as forwards like Rob Brown, were starting to play and shine in the presence of Coffee. And with new head coach Gene Ubraco, I think that's how you pronounce it, the Pens were a whole new team, and indeed, for the first time in seven years, they made the playoffs, finishing second in the Patrick Division, just five points behind the Washington Capitals. As for our hero's big year, he was sixth in the league in scoring, and for the sixth time in his career, led all defensemen in scoring by 38 points. As for the Norris Trophy, he was a finalist for the first time in three years, but didn't win, and was the first runner-up, however, to Chris Chelios, who did indeed have a career year. Coffee, however, was a first-team All-Star for the third time in his career. And well, how did Coffee fare with the magnificent one who had 85 goals and 114 assists? Hmm, who does that remind you of? Anyway, yes indeed, Lemieux was the only player in NHL history at this point not named Gretzky to reach those numbers. So out of Lemieux's utterly insane 85 goals, third best ever at the time, Coffee assisted on 29 of them. 34.1% and best on the team, edging out Lemieux's line mate, Rob Brown. This also means nearly 35% of Coffee's assists that year were to Lemieux. As for Coffee's 30 goals, his highest in three years, like last year, just slightly under half, Lemieux assisted on many of them. And now we go to my favorite, assist collaborations. Lemieux had 114 assists that year and Coffee runs away with it with 24 up from last year and again leading the category as he and Lemieux much like he and Gretzky did for years led the team in assists and were a destructive force together helping benefit teammates such as Rob Brown who finishes second behind Coffee. and now here we are playoff time something Coffee knows all about and Lemieux knows nothing about so it's important that the two are together in order to make any progress for the club. In the opening round, they face a rebuilding New York Rangers club led by Thomas Sandstrom, Hall of Famer Guy Lafleur, who had just come out of retirement, and their sensational rookie phenom defenseman, Brian Leach. The games were highly competitive, and the Rangers even found a way to contain Lemieux in a couple of games, but they weren't able to contain Coffee. Two goals, seven assists, nine points in a four-game sweep and a plus two. Their first playoff win since 1975. Wow. Next up were the Immortal Enemies, much like the Flames were to the Oilers, that's what the Flyers were to the Penguins. Indeed, that was the next round. Game 1 in Pittsburgh was tense from the get-go, but a big night from up-and-coming Kevin Stevens gave the Pens a 4-3 win. The Flyers have a reward back in Game 2 of the series thanks to the scoring machine Tim Kerr and goaltending from Ron Hextall. They won 4-2. Heading into Philly for Game 3, Lemieux was, has been criticized for his performance so far in his playoffs. And while Coffey is under the microscope now as well for how he played in the first two games of the series, well, they both responded, and despite the Pens blowing a two-goal lead, they won in overtime thanks to Phil Bork and now had the series lead. But in Game 4, the dynamic duo was nowhere to be found, and Philly tied the series at two apiece. Game 5, they needed to respond, and holy moly, what a game! Utterly insane goal fest to combine 17 goals! Lemieux scored five goals and tied a playoff record with eight points! Still stands to this day tied with Patrick Sundstrom of the Devils. Coffee, you ask? Had four assists and that 10-7 Penguins win. Just one away from reaching their first conference final since 1970. Going back to Philly for game six, however, the Pens were humiliated. Six to two. Coffee and Lemieux, zero points between them. And Kerr taking them apart yet again. And to boot, our heroes were a minus three. But they could still bounce back in Game 7 at home and... <sighs> but hey, they were both in on the only goal they scored in the game. And were both minus 3 again. It was not a great series for Coffey. Six assists, four of which came in one game. And was tied with Dan Quinn for the team worst minus 9 in the series. Speaking of Quinn, he and Rob Brown didn't exactly come to play either to be fair. Coffey is a veteran on a young team with still developing talent, however. In Edmonton, he was one of those guys. This is a much different role for him. It's a lesson learned. Don't get too far ahead of the game. This experience will hopefully just make the Penguins wiser, much like it did for the Oilers way back when. But for Coffey, he was 110% himself again as a player and had an incredible year. 
30 goals, 83 assists, 113 points. The fourth 100 point season of his career, leading all defensemen scoring for the fifth time. Sixth in the entire league in scoring, runner up for the Norris Trophy. His fourth first team All Star selection. Played in, in the NHL All Star game for the seventh time and helped the Penguins with their first playoff appearance in seven years and playoff series win in 14 years. Going into the 1989-90 season, things were very apparent in Pittsburgh that while they had a good year the previous season, it seemed as though they needed some more building to do. And it seemed as though General Manager Tony Esposito wasn't the one to do it, as he ended up being every bit as good as the job as, well, his brother Phil at anywhere else. But regardless, he still had the job going into the season, as did coach Gene Ubriaco. We looked at Paul's matter of working with top forwards, and in the previous video we talked about his fellow defensemen. When Edmonton he had the likes of Hall of Famer Kevin Lowe and Charlie Huddy and Lee Fogelin. While Fogelin and Huddy might not be Hall of Famers, they are fondly remembered, and yes, even Huddy, I will argue that to this day. And also had Riso Silton in for a good short time. However, in Pittsburgh at this point, he had Zarly Zalapski, who was pretty good, Gordonine, Rob Buskas, and Randy Hillier, to name a few. Now, Zalapski went on to have a decent career, but none of those names could truly match up to those in Edmonton. And this is Coffey's defense. This is where his defensive play would truly suffer. Now, again, I will still stress, that's not what he was paid to do, but the reason it worked so well in Edmonton is because the defensive defensemen were effective. In Pittsburgh, that wasn't simply the case. And it would not be a great year for the Penguins. After 26 games, both Ubriaco and Tony O were fired after a 10-14-2 start from the Penguins. And Craig Patrick came in and took both roles, and this would be huge. Well, in the long run, anyway. In those first 26 games, however, Lemieux was playing just fine offensively. Lemieux had 16 goals and 35 assists for 51 points, while Coffey was struggling a little bit offensively with 22 points in those 26 games. However... As Craig Patrick, at least, was very goal-oriented in his job, but this year was not going to go well for the Penguins as a whole. Dan Quinn struggled and was traded mid-season. Coffey started to pick up a lot more, however, around the All-Star break, but Rob Brown was struggling with consistency and his production saw a decrease. Tom Barrasso, the team's star goaltender, who they acquired a year before, was dealing with personal issues regarding his young daughter and her tragic cancer diagnosis. Emergence of young stars, however, such as Mark Recchi, John Cullen, and Kevin Stevens, gave the team even more hope. Coffey never experienced many games away from Gretzky and Edmonton until his final year with the team. However, this was going to be a new experience for our hero, as Lemieux had a terrible back issue, which he fought with all his might throughout the entire season. But after 58 games, he literally went until he just couldn't anymore. And his departure sadly happened when the Pens were actually picking things up a little bit in the standings, and Lemieux was leading the scoring race. And in their first 58 games together, neither one missed a single game before Lemieux's injury. As Lemieux's 121 points had him averaging nearly 2.1 points a game, while Coffey had 80 points and was averaging nearly 1.4 points a game. In Lemieux's absence, Coffey does stay consistent and actually picks up the load a little more. Again, something he wasn't used to in Edmonton, but he still was up to the task and did it. Yet, he does stay consistent, but again, saw a bit of a decrease as well towards the end of the season. But be that as it may, he was still one of their top players. But on the final day of the season, Coffey still had an excellent year offensively at that point, but you could see by minus 25, a career low that he'd never match again, that the Penguins' actual defensive play was staggeringly bad at this point. They weren't surrounding Coffey with the right guys. The Pens lacked any real depth. Despite Coffey having 29 goals and 74 assists for 103 points, his fifth 100-point season, and was ninth in league scoring, and then for the second consecutive year and seventh overall, he led all defensemen in scoring, and for the fourth time in his career was named a second-team All-Star, giving him seven All-Star selections overall. As for the Norris Trophy, however, he barely missed out on being a finalist, and no, I won't fault Doug Wilson this time again. He had a great year. On the final weekend of the season, however, the Patrick Division's final playoff spot was still up for grabs and the Penguins were holding on with just one point, barely. With Mario in the lineup, they were 27, 27, and 4. In the next 21 games, they went 5, 12, and 4. Oy, oy, oy. But either way, a win over the Buffalo Sabres, who had punched their ticket to the playoffs in their own division, is all they needed to clinch. 
Neither the Islanders or the Flyers could catch them if that was the case. And this was indeed the Penguins' last game of the season. A win, also important because the Flyers and Islanders were playing each other that day. And either one of them were still capable of catching them. But Coffey was there. And fighting through the pain, Mario Lemieux returned for this all-important game. It was scoreless after a period. But Doug Smith got the Penguins on the board as they were trying to limit Mario's ice time as much as they possibly could to further aggravate his injury. But the Sabres took the lead after goals from rookie Alex McGillney and veteran Rick Vive, and they led 2-1 after two periods. But Coffey and magnificent Mario come up big in the power play in the third period and tie the game. Lemieux notches his 45th goal this season early in the frame. We are off to overtime. A tie won't clinch it. But... Ah... You a croup, you clutch bastard. Ugh. The Penguins lose and the Islanders crush the Flyers and the Hens were out of the playoffs. Regardless, we still go over the stats of the two stars. Lemieux scored 45 goals, the second lowest of his career. And Coffee has done 19, tops on the team, 42.2%. Incredible. Coffee scored 29 goals and Lemieux would assist on nearly half once again. The numbers are still consistent with these two overall in their third season together. Let's see the assist collaborations. Lemieux had 78 helpers on the year, still excellent for a shortened season, and Coffey led the way again collaborating on 15 of them. So for Coffey it was a good year, but not one that sticks out above all in the year prior. 29 goals, 74 assists, 103 points, second All-Star team selection, his fourth and seventh overall All-Star selection, fourth in Norris Trophy voting, fifth 100-point season, played in his eighth All-Star game, and after the season, played for Team Canada in the IHF World Championships and scored a goal and six assists for seven points in ten games, but Canada would finish fourth place. Going into the 1990-91 season, the Penguins needed to make some changes, and Craig Patrick did just that. He had no interest in coaching, and said he'd be focusing on becoming the general manager and the general manager only. He hired the great Scotty Bowman to work in player personnel, and had a new coach, Badger Bob Johnson, who hadn't coached in the NHL for three years, but was president of USA Hockey in that time frame. He had an impressive resume as a legendary coach of the University of Wisconsin, winning three NCAA national championships. He helped build the Calgary Flames into a contender in the 1980s, but until someone else took over and got all the credit. Hmm. And now he was back in the NHL, but this was who the team needed. Also, they acquired the great Brian Troche in the offseason to provide leadership, veteran-wise, and some depth. But they'd be entering the season without Mario Lemieux, who was still recovering, meaning coffee and young talents such as Mark Recchi, Kevin Stevens, and some kid from the Czech Republic with a really cool mullet would have to step up. The team got off to a rough start, when while our hero was still playing pretty good, some players weren't, including Rob Brown, and he was traded. At last, however, some defensive death would be added to the team early in the year, as they acquired 16-year veteran Gordy Roberts from the St. Louis Blues. But the team was missing Mario in a big way, but Johnson's approach was working. It was starting to really help the team in many ways. They had played 50 games with other star player to begin the season, and in those 50 games, the team was 26, 21, and 3. Good enough at that time for second place behind the New York Rangers. At that time, Coffey was carrying a heavy load, but doing pretty darn well. He had 19 goals and 45 assists for 64, averaging 1.28 points a game. It also helped that the Pens acquired star defenseman Larry Murphy from Minnesota. Remember him? Lemieux would come back and only miss four more games the rest of the year. Coffey would also miss four out of the last 30 as well, but would score five goals and 24 assists for 29 points in those remaining games, averaging just over a point a game, finishing with 93 on the year, 24 goals and 69 assists, and still found himself staying very consistent and contributing very much so. He finished third this time amongst defensemen in scoring, and in Norris Trophy voting, came in fifth. But while his numbers slipped slightly, he made history on December 22nd, 1990. He became only the second defenseman in NHL history to score a thousand career points, as the only other one was Denny Potvin. And by the end of the season, he was only seven points behind Potvin, as Coffey had 10.45 to Potvin's 10.52, closing in on such a huge record. It's definitely a feather in the cap of the naysayers, and Coffee indeed 
had another really good year, but what it came down to was this. The Penguins finished 41-33-6, and 88 points, another really good year. But what it comes down to primarily, however, is they were first place in the Patrick Division, their first division title ever. Now, Coffey and Lemieux's numbers, despite, well, you know, Lemieux's mere 26 games all season, look like this. Now, Lemieux did score 16 goals, and Coffey assisted on five, nearly a third. And despite tying with Bob Airy, Coffey keeps that streak alive, despite emerging players. As for Coffey's 24 goals, Lemieux didn't assist on any. And though we should keep in mind, Coffey only scored five goals after Lemieux's return. You'd think he, he'd consider passing trends that... At least one would be there, but regardless, Coffey's best chemistry all year actually came with John Cullen, who the Pens made a big, big risk trading as he was among the league's leading scorers at the time for a two-way center and all-star forward Ron Francis who spent 10 years in Hartford. I guess that's like a minimum security prison for most. Now, as for assist collaborations, no big numbers this year. And for the first time, Coffey wouldn't be in first place. That belonged to Mark Recchi. Coffey shared a third-place tie with longtime counterpart and contemporary... Larry Murphy. Someone points to Murphy's arrival as changing Coffee's future with the club, but we'll get to that. The Pens were now set for the playoffs, and Coffee was still the man with the best playoff experience on the club next to Trottier. They made some big moves, acquired some depth, and the defense was a huge improvement over years past. The Mew had Coffee like Gretzky did, but at last he had perhaps his Curry, Anderson, and Messi to go with him with Stevens, Recchi, Yager, and you can throw Ron Francis now into that mix. Coffey finally has some reliable defense backing him up. Gordy Roberts, Ulf Samuelson who came over in the Francis trade. Also you have the highly underrated Paul Stanton who had a good year that year, and Larry Murphy. Tom Barrasso was in net and it was go time. The opening round saw the Pens take on the upstart New Jersey Devils, who bolster a tremendous young lineup of Kirk Muller, John McClain, Claude Lemieux, and Brandon Shanahan, and now had veteran all-star Peter Stassi in the lineup. The Pens were heavily favored, but the Devils shocked the Pens in Game 1 thanks to Stassi's two goals and Chris Terreri's goaltending and win 3-1. Game 2 is a back and forth real ride and our hero plays very very well and it goes to overtime. And Yarmir Yager's coming out party takes full force with a huge game winner. The series is tied. In the Garden State for Game 3, Coffee and Lemieux are excellent but it's Mark Recchi who steals the show with a 3 point night including the game winner with just 50 seconds left to play. We're off to Game 4 and the Devils humiliate the hands 4-1. to one. Playoff warrior Claude Lemieux has a big night. And to add salt to the wound, Coffee is hurt and will miss the next game. The series shifts back to Pittsburgh for Game 5, and the Hens are put down again on their home ice. The Devils outplay them in every fashion, and Mario is held pointless in a 4-2 loss. <sighs> game 6 in New Jersey. Oh, Pittsburgh, will you ever learn, will you? Huh? You clearly don't have the depth to hoist the cup. You're nothing. You're pathetic. You're simply not championship material. Oh, ne never mind. The Pens sweep out a 4-3 win to force Game 7. And indeed, the igloo is psyched, and Coffee is back in the lineup, and yes, yes, he scored the nail in the coffin as Frank Pietrangelo, the backup goaltender, is brilliant in net, and we are off to the next round. Coffee plays well in the series despite missing a couple of games and playing rough in another, but still, he helped the Penguins avoid a huge upset. But oh, here come the critics. As the Penguins now face another upstart team, the Capitals, who pulled off a small upset against the Rangers. The Caps had the likes of Dynamo Dino Cicerelli now on their club, as well as solid goaltender Don Popre, and yes, there's veteran blue liner Rod Langway. They say it's just a matter of time before the Penguins go just choking. Oh, look at that. They lose game one. No surprise there. Lose at home, but ah, oh, but we get a thrilling goal fest in game two, and coffee is brilliant. But the Pens lose the lead and are down 6-5 to five as Coffey begins a play that leads to a Randy Gilhan goal, giving our hero his fourth assist of the game, but devastation strikes as a bad puck shot and a nail ball from resident Batman Dale Hunter gives Coffey a serious jaw injury, takes him out the rest of the series. The Pens, however, win it in OT, and they take the series in five. Unbelievable. Coffee had an amazing performance in Game 2, which set the Penguins on the path to win this series. This injury will sideline him for a while. But the Penguins make their first conference final in 20-some years, and they face the big bad Bruins, who had one of the best records in the NHL. Coffee will miss the entire series, as that's a shame. This would have been the only time we'd have gotten to see he and Ray Bork face each other in the playoffs. It's a grueling series, 
but the Penguins take it in six games. They are going to the Stanley Cup Finals for the very first time. At last, their chance has come, and Coffey, despite missing this series, is still a big part of this team's journey to success. His status, however, for Game 1 is in the air. All the hardships, all the jokes, Mario's promise, and Coffey's acquisition, it all comes down to this. They face a huge underdog, but a team that has eliminated two of the best teams in the league and the defending Stanley Cup champions on their path, the Minnesota North Stars. Loaded with talent, mainstays such as Bro Neil Broughton, Brian Bellows, men loaded with playoff experience and Brian Brop and Bobby Smith, and a youngster named Modano. The amped up crowd at the Igloo was ready, but they lost game one. By a narrow margin of 5-4 and Coffee was not in action. Coffee did dress for game two, but saw limited action, but the Penguins saw it to take a 4-1 win to tie the series going to Minnesota. Namu, Coffee, Recky, Stevens, and Francis were all held off the score sheet in a 3-1 loss in Game 3, however, as the Stars took a 2-1 series lead. John Casey was brilliant in net as he'd been the whole playoffs. This cannot be happening. Come on, Pittsburgh. Are you really going to be here? Oh, never mind. In Game 4, the Penguins take a 3-0 lead three minutes in and didn't look back on the way to a 5-3 win to tie the series. In Game 5, Pittsburgh truly came alive once again. Coffey came alive on the power play, leading an attack with two assists on the extra man advantage on the day as the Penguins take a series lead for the first time with a 6-4 win or one game away from the promised land. And well, kind of an anticlimactic ending, the Pittsburgh Penguins win 8 to nothing, humiliating the Stars in Minnesota. Yes, the journey that began with an 18-year-old kid who barely even wanted to come to the team that continued with a superstar defenseman with immense success coming into their squad and built further into a team built with young, talented, future Hall of Fame players and some that could have been on that path, Craig Patrick made the right moves and they responded to Coach Bob Johnson. Stanley Cup Champions. Coffee's fourth of his career. And while he may not have been as active in these playoffs as he had been in the past, his performance in Game 5 was unbelievable. And the fact is, the way Lemieux's game skyrocketed right after Coffee arrived, the path was carved thanks to him joining the team. The numbers we showed you tell a lot of the tale, and Lemieux now had all the right guys around him to be champions, much like Gretzky did years before. Coffee's reason for arriving in this club had been realized. Coffee had a lot to be proud of in his fourth season in Pittsburgh as he has under Stanley Cup to his resume. He took on a whole new task arriving in this, this team, and he and Lemieux drove ahead, and he soon joined others to complete it. Coffee had 29 goals, 64 assists for 93 points, reaches a thousand career point, only the second defenseman to do so, played in another All-Star game, fifth in Norris voting, and above all, his fourth Stanley Cup ring. During the summer of 1991, Paul Coffey was preparing to play in his third Canada Cup for Team Canada. As a matter of fact, also preparing for that tournament was Penguins coach Bob Johnson, who for many years now was a significant part of the USA hockey program. Unfortunately, however, during this time, Johnson was diagnosed with brain cancer and would have to begin treatment, which also left his future with the Penguins seeming a little uncertain. However, General Manager Craig Patrick addressed the issue pretty quick, saying that Johnson's job would be waiting for him when he was well enough. Hmm, see what a compassion GM does for his coach, Bob Clark? Anyway, the Canada Cup went on. And while it wasn't the same as the Oiler representation on Team Canada, as teammate Larry Murphy was the only one joining Coffee on the Penguins this year, as Lemieux was unable to play, and it likes Recchi and Francis weren't selected, but a total of six Penguins players were at the Canada Cup, representing other countries. The 1997 act, however, was a tough one to follow, as many European players had defected to the NHL. Prominent contenders of the Soviet Union were weakened significantly through this tournament, and is notable for and this tournament is only notable for really four things. Gary Cedars hit on Wayne Gretzky during game one of the finals that many feel changed the trajectory of the Great One's career. Tommy Soderstrom's mask breaking, thanks to Steve Larmer's slap shot. Larmer's breakaway insurance marker to give Team Canada the win and the championship, and lastly, igniting the Canada-USA hockey rivalry. Coffey walked away with his third Canada Cup and played very well with a goal, six assists for seven points in eight games and was alternate captain of the team to boot. But in terms of defensemen, it was Al McInnes who stole the show in this one. The Penguins should 
be on top of the world going into the 91-92 season with the health of their coach, Bob Johnson, is on their minds. Johnson was not only highly respected and revered by his players, but he was also very well liked. So rather than scouring the league for a new interim coach, there was one right under their nose already working for the team in their front office, Scotty Bowman. To sum it up, Bowman started his coaching career in St. Louis with the expansion Blues, and they made it to the three straight finals appearance. He moved on to the Montreal Canadiens and, well, eight seasons, five Stanley Cups, need I say more. In Buffalo, he was a GM and a coach for nearly eight years. Didn't have the same success and had no championships and barely had any playoff success. But he did draft future Hall of Famers Dave Anderchuk and Phil Housley in the same first round in the same year and built a perennial playoff team and, you know, had a couple of great players, but they just couldn't get past that next level. He became a color analyst for three years for Hockey Night in Canada, then took the job with the Penguins last season. Bowman was a different beast, however. He was respected but not very well liked throughout his career, but that was not what he was concerned about. Success was the only thing on his mind. Well, no star players called for his head. That's because they kept winning and kept having success. success, success. He had a ready championship-made team in front of him, but the Pens weren't exactly warming up to him as a whole. He was a polar opposite of Badger in many ways, and some criticized Bowman for not taking a hands-on approach to the team. But really, this was mainly due to Johnson's absence, as Bowman truly felt that he would be back, and so did several others. Assistant coaches took over most of the practices, as Bowman was still living in Buffalo at the time. Be that as it may, however, the Penguins and our heroes still had a season to play. Now, remember how I mentioned earlier that he was just 8 points away from passing Denny Potvin on the all-time defensive scoring list? Well... He got out to a great start in the 91-92 season, and by the sixth game of the year, he was ready. On October 17, 1991, the Penguins were hosting the New York Islanders, a team Potvin had spent his entire 15-year career with. He was at 1051 points behind Potvin's 1052. Fans in attendance knew what was at stake here, and every time Coffee got touched the puck, they would cheer and got excited. And just over five minutes into the game, he and Lemieux set up Kevin Stevens for a goal. Coffee has an assist, the record was now tied. Penguin had a 4-1 lead in the middle of the second period, but Coffee still had only one point in the game. And to boot, the Penguins collapsed and were now down 5-4 after 40 minutes. But in the third, Coffee becomes the all-time leading scoring defenseman, assisting on this goal from Bob Airy. He had done it in the beginning of his 12th season to boot. The fans went crazy, the naysayers were silenced. This play also tied the game as the Pens bounce back for an 8-5 win. Coffey now held the record, but he also knew his contemporaries were still emerging. Ray Bork himself was having one of the best years of his career, as was Al McInnes. Youngster Brian Leach at this point were all in their prime. Even teammate Larry Murphy was moving up that all-time scoring list, and veteran Larry Robinson was still active, but he wasn't really a threat at this point at the age of 40 and in the final year of his career playing for the LA Kings. But this night belonged to Coffey, and he had earned it through his natural skills and a hard work ethic. I don't care what anyone says. By November 26, 1991, the Pens had a record of 10-8-4, 24 points, fourth place in the Patrick Division. Not terrible, but far from what a defending champion should be. The star players, for the most part, were delivering statistically, but the team as a whole was not because the man who brought it all together, Bob Johnson, was not there. Sadly, it was on November 26, 1991 that Bob Johnson would pass away from brain cancer. He was 60 years old. At the beginning of the season, things were in place for Johnson to come back, but now the void was even bigger. The man they held in such high regard was gone. An emotional tribute to the Badger took place the following night as they hosted the New Jersey Devils and his motto, It's a great day for hockey, was etched on the team's ice surface. And they wore a commemorative patch on their jerseys as they took an 8-4 win over the Devils. And Coffey, who held Badger in high in regard like his teammates did, had a four-point night. Scotty Bowman was named the permanent head coach and the players were not responding to him very well, his relationship with the team was tumultuous. Be it Johnson's passing, or Bowman's methods, or a combination of both, and a few other things, the Penguins were still looking a lot better in January. As the team rode into the new year, things looking a little bit better. They were inspired to win for their departed coach, 
The team was now 22-13-4 for 48 points. Third place, but only behind the Capitals and Rangers, who had 51 points each at the time. So not bad at all. They were emerging like the champions they are. The coffee at the time was third amongst defensemen in scoring. The thing was, this was now Bowman's team to coach, and he was not a fan of coffee style of play. And yes, it's easy to argue, and I may as well, as a matter of fact, that Bowman had an old-school way of thinking. But it's hard to argue with his track record, even in a modern game at this time, but Bowman also hadn't coached in five years. Bowman thought that defensemen who rack up offensive numbers should still know how to play defense. That's how guys like Larry Robinson were successful throughout their careers, but that was never Coffey's style. And for another, it's not what he was brought for Pittsburgh to do. But now the Penguins had Larry Murphy, who Bowman was a fan of. Murphy was a multi-dimensional defenseman and could rack up offensive numbers to boot, no surprise there. And on New Year's Day, he himself had a 33 points. But there was a stat that Bowman seemingly often looked at, and that was a plus-minus. Now, yes, a bunch of you are going to say, It don't matter! Plus-minus don't matter! Blah, 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 blah. Do I think it matters? Well, it depends on the context, really. For one, Coffey was in the minus every year since he joined the Penguins, yet every year on the Oilers he was on the plus side of things, and usually among the league leaders in that stat. Larry Murphy had success in that department in his career as well. But let's look at this in, uh, in, in look, look at it in this contest. I'm only freestyling here and guessing, but when you have two defensemen on it's the same team, you can put up really good offensive numbers year after year, it may come down to a choice of who has a better defensive presence to make the team a little more complete, give it a little more depth, if you will, as the coach feels. I maintain that's not what Coffey was paid to do in either Edmonton or Pittsburgh once again. But things change, teams change, and coaches change, and most of all, the game changes. Coffey was still sharp, and he was at a plus seven, actually, at this point, on the verge of finishing on the plus side for the very first time since he arrived in Pittsburgh. But Murphy was a plus 27. And as I said, and I'll elaborate this further on in the series, but Bowman wasn't overly keen on Coffey's style, but was always a fan of Murphy. They were both first-round draft picks in 1980, and were both playing in their 12th seasons. Let's look at the plus-minus comparisons between the two in their first 11 seasons, just for fun. Now, as you see, the career highs Coffey has Murphy beat, playing on an Oiler squads that were, of course, stacked to the gills. Murphy played on some really excellent Washington Capitals teams as well, but were nowhere near the caliber of the Oilers. Also, the only times Murphy hit the minus in, in a given year was three times, each of those losing record seasons with losing teams with the Kings and the North Stars. Coffey's four comes from all his seasons with the Penguins, where the team only had a losing record once. Clearly, Bowman knows the guy he wants to be his top defenseman. And no, I'm not saying Murphy is better than Coffey. Please don't get upset and at me in the comments, as the kids say. Far from it. I'm mainly zeroing in on just certain aspects and trying to understand Bowman and Patrick's logic of what would come and why. Because he started playing Coffey on the wing on some shifts. He even had his ice time slightly decreased, and this was happening even before January. Speaking of January, that was a disastrous month for the Penguins and where the tension between Bowman and the team would start to escalate in a big way, winning just three games out of 11. February wasn't much better either. The Penguins were on a six-game winless streak going in to a battle at home against the lowly Toronto Maple Leafs on February the 18th. And the Pens were 26-24-7 and for 59 points, had fallen back to fourth place 10 points behind an improving New Jersey Devils squad and far out of reach from the Capitals and Rangers and only four points ahead of fifth place Islanders for that final playoff spot. In the 18 games since New Year's, Coffee had only played in 14 due to injuries, had a goal and 15 assists for 16 points, but it was a minus six. And while Murphy had seven goals and nine assists for 16 points in his own right and played in 17 of the last 20 games, but he was also a minus four. Coffee was still ahead in scoring, but was down to a plus one of the season, while Murphy was still a plus 23. While neither man was playing overly well since New Year's, the team as a whole was struggling, as Mary Lemieux had also missed several games during the season as well, but not nearly as much as the year before. The game is against the Toronto Maple Leafs, and it was a one-sided affair as the Penguins snapped their streak. Paul Coffey was excellent. Played one of the best games of the year, with a goal and an assist that was a plus three. The Penguins won 7-1. It was Coffee's last game as a penguin. Something was in the works, and the rumors were swirling as the trade deadline approached, but still many were shocked to learn. On the day of February 19, 1992, Paul Coffee was traded to the Los Angeles Kings. 
exchange for defenseman Brian Benning, knuckle dragging defenseman Jeff Chitter and Ticker and Ticker and whatever the hell you pronounce his name. I never liked him anyway. And a first round draft pick. So basically, a bag of pucks, you might be thinking. Well, it's an arguable point, but I will say this. Brian Benning was having an excellent year. The first round draft pick could do a lot of wonders, obviously, for any team. But are these really worth the Paul Coffee? Maybe not. Be that as it may, Benning and the draft pick were actually all part of a bigger picture. As that very same day, they used them to send to Philadelphia, along with star forward Mark Reckie, who Bowman didn't also care for much either, to obtain backup goaltender Ken Reggett, veteran defenseman Jell Samuelson, and a third round draft pick in 1993, and the principal part of the trade, power scoring forward Rick Tockett. So at the end of the day, Coffee actually was a part of a widespread plan of what Bowman and Patrick wanted the Penguins to be going forward. It was a weird year to say the least, but before we get to what happened over there, let's go over Coffee's last year in Pittsburgh and his last year with Mario. At the time of the trade, Mario had 29 goals, and Coffee had assists on 5 of those, 17.2% behind Yager and Kevin Stevens. The former breaking out huge, and the latter having a career year. Out of Coffee's 10 goals, Lemieux assisted on 3 of them. Mainly, most of Coffee's goals were assisted by Joe Mullen that year. For Lemieux as a whole on the year, before the trade, he had 86 points and was averaging 1.9 points a game in 45 of the games he played at this point. The remainder of the season for Lemieux, he had 15 goals, 30 assists, and 45 points in the remaining games he played, which totaled 19 games, averaging over 2.3 points a game. As his chemistry with Stevens and Yager continued, especially the former on the year, while Tockett also had an immediate impact, and Murphy continued to shine in Pittsburgh to boot, but let's look at the assist collaborations first. Before the trade, Coffey did lead the way once again. He did so all but one year with the Penguins at this point, and, this, and that was last season, as he leaves the team just three ahead of Kevin Stevens. After the trade, Coffey only slipped a third, one behind Stevens and two behind Larry Murphy, who took first and filled a certain void. So let's go over Coffey's final season in Pittsburgh. He had 10 goals, 54 assists for 64 points in 54 games. Played in his 10th NHL All-Star game, became the all-time leading scorer among defensemen, and started the year with the Canada Cup. So indeed, Coffey was off to Los Angeles, and at the time he was still third in scoring among defensemen. And actually, speaking of some defensemen, he was about to be reunited with some of his Oilers teammates, including Charlie Huddy, the man he paired with for many years, and Marty McSorley. But the two names that everyone was going on about him reuniting were Yari Curry, who is now a king, and of course, Wayne Gretzky. Curry seemed like a shell of his old self after departing Edmonton, some would say, for a year in Europe and returning to play alongside Wayne, but I say hooey on that, just because he wasn't racking up the same stats every year. Yet Wayne himself was dealing with severe back issues after taking a terrible hit from Gary Suter in the Canada Cup and had a down year, and by that I mean he only scored 121 points and finished third in scoring and failed to reach 40 goals for the first time in his career. The Kings were a team that could never stay in one direction, however, since Gretzky's arrival in 1988. His first year there, the team did very well, and they won the first round of the playoffs. His second year, they didn't, yet they won in the first round of the playoffs. In 1990-91, they had a great year and finished first in the Smite division. Again, they won in the first round of the playoffs, but didn't win in the second. When Coffee arrived, the team was 24, 22, and 13 with 61 points, clinging on to second place by just two points over the Winnipeg Jets, and behind in first place, eight points behind the resurgent Canucks. In his debut with the Kings on the day of the trade, Coffey scored an unassisted goal as the Kings lost on the road to Coffey's first team, the Oilers. Coffey, however, was injured in that game and would miss the next four games. He returned, got an assist in his second game as a king, and his king's point streak continued to win over Montreal yet again, but again was hurt missing the next three games, returning against the Leafs. So the kings won, but the next three games were a disaster for Coffey. He had one point and was minus six. Coffey battled injuries and inconsistent play, having trouble adjusting to Los Angeles all season long. It was clear how he didn't want to leave Pittsburgh, and I'm not saying he phoned it in whatsoever, Coffey never would do that. But still, when a trade happens, when you're on a successful team, two things will happen. Either you're motivated to be better and hoping to adjust to the new team you have, or, bottom line, 
you don't do very well because you just have trouble simply adjusting to a system. The King's team was on the way to some big changes in the near future, and that would play a factor in a lot of things which we'll get to in the next video. The numbers aren't big at all with Coffee, and to be fair, he never had much playing time with Gretzky who saw, well, limited time on the ice due to his recurring injuries. In just 10 games, Coffee had 5 points, and while neither assisted on any of each other's goals, two of Coffee's 5 assists were with his old friend collaborating. But to give context as we prepare to wrap up this video and get to the next part, here were Gretzky's assist collaborations that year and the players that he was working well with at that time. In their first time playing alongside each other in after three seasons, Curry is back playing his role as his go-to guy on assist collaborations while star winger Luke Robitaille is second, and the man they traded coffee for, Brian Benning, was actually third. The Kings did make the playoffs and finished in second place, and coffee was healthy for the opening round series against the Edmonton Oilers. Yes indeed, old pockets Pocklington and Slats let their team go down the slider. Oh yes, they may have won two Stanley Cups since Coffey left, one of them being without Gretzky as well, but the only remnants from those championship days were Kevin Lowe and an injury prone as a Tekken in that year, and the man they traded Coffey for, Craig Simpson, was also having injury issues on and off. But they did have a superb goaltender in Bill Renford and star forwards Vincent Damfus and Bernie Nichols. Game 1, the Oilers play a tight game and the Kings lose 3-1, as Coffey does play a little bit poorly, but not overly bad in the same way. In Game 2, the Kings roared back and Coffee was outstanding. Two goals, two assists for a four-point night as the series shifts to Edmonton. What follows is two exciting close-knit games against split by both teams as Bernie Nichols, the former King, scores a power play goal midway through the third in Game 3. And in Game 4, Coffee is a machine again. Two goals and an assist in a 4-3 win for the Kings. Game 5, however, back in L.A. sees the team not gel well. And the Oilers, well... They win 5-2. It is bad, to say the least, as heading into Game 6 in Edmonton, it's curtains for the Kings. 3 nothing win for Edmonton. Again, everyone plays poorly. Can't single out any one player here. And the Kings are out. So much for redemption. Coffey did play very well in this series for the most part, but it was not enough. Four goals, three assists for seven points, and six games isn't bad, but he was also a team worse, minus five. His first season in L.A. was nothing to write home about. You can see in an interview, as I mentioned earlier that I alluded to, that he was not happy being traded away from Pittsburgh. I'm sure he was happy to be reunited with some of his teammates and friends, no doubt. But either way, he thought he had something good going in the town despite issues with Scotty Bowman. And for the first time since his rookie year, he didn't register a single vote for the Norris Trophy. Yes, Coffee's year with the Penguins was a tumultuous one, but I, of course, am being slightly dramatic. Overall, his year wasn't a terrible one by any stretch of the imagination. It wasn't even remotely bad. Maybe it's just one he'd like to forget due to what was going on mainly behind the scenes. 11 goals, 58 assists for 69 points. He started the year with a Canada Cup, became the league's top scoring defenseman of all time, played in his 10th All-Star game. While this year did not pan out for him, he did at least have something to look forward to. Playing alongside his old teammates Goretzky and Curry, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. And what happened in Pittsburgh, you ask? Well... Yes, we end this video how it started, pretty much. Coffee leaves the team and they still win the cup. But let's face it, people. A lot of these teams win because of the trajectory that they were on, and thankfully, Coffee was a huge part of those, both in Edmonton and Pittsburgh at this point. And again, they wouldn't even be a championship team had Coffee not joined them in 87-88. I will always maintain that. I dare say his influence on Lemieux was every bit as much a factor. Some would even say more of an influence on Gretzky. I'll leave that for you, the fans, to decide. Could he recapture it again? Who knows? Coffee may not have won as much hardware in the five seasons with the Pens as he did at Edmonton, but Lemieux became a better in large part thanks to him. But Coffee's journey is far from over, and he's still got a lot left in him, as we'll look at our next video in part three. Goodbye, Hollywood. Hello, Motor City. That should give you a little teaser for what's happening. Until next time, so long. Please hit like, subscribe to the channel, comment on the video, what other players would you like to see me go over throughout their illustrious, or even not so illustrious careers? I'm all open for suggestions. Until next time, I'll see you later.